things that could be, because I deal with population figures and demographics. And, you know, when I was in graduate school, the demographics was that there were only 5 million indigenous people in the whole Western Hemisphere when the Europeans came, lightly populated. Now the minimum that's suggested is 100 million, which is much more than it was in Europe, including the Cauc from the Caucasus to all of Europe. Uh, but it's probably much more than that, just based upon the food supply that was available and the storage of food, how many people could be supported. So they looked at these, these, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, civilizations, the Mayan and the Aztec and the, and the uh, Amorai and the Tetra, the fantastic road systems and, and buildings and, and they would actually come up with, in order to keep that population low, that these were ceremonial centers. No one lived there. People built whole cities, but they didn't live in there. <laughs> and I had put up a new map. I thought, how could anyone ever think that? You know, I mean, that's absurd. You know, it, it, it makes no logical sense. So, you know, when you, so I completely transformed my thinking of the future what it could be, that, that that current, you know, just under the crust, when I say under the crust of, of this whole hemisphere, that is a living, you know, living, breathing um, reality. That, and to me, the decolonization has to have a positive aspect of the people who are here now, indigenous people, that is the root, you know, and people moved a lot. Uh, the assigned, where you're assigned to live. You know, I, I think one, we have to fight for the land base that exists, I don't even question that. But beyond that, plus, plus everything else. And I'll end with just saying, you know, how I amuse myself in, my, in the UN work when it gets boring. Um, the non-governmental organizations have to sit behind the uh, states that, that don't have voting uh, privileges. It used to be Saudi Arabia. Uh, they choose not to be in the UN. But Saudi Arabia is a voting state now. Um, Switzerland used to be non-voting. Well, one non-voting state is the Holy See the Vatican, is one square mile state. It is a state. It used to be all of Europe. It made the law, the, the doctrine of discovery. That was made by the church. International law was created by it. The whole of imperialism was created under these laws. The church took them up too. So I sit there and I say, one day there will be a Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be all black, you know, be a black representative. <laughs> and the rest of the country is, you know, the U.S. will disappear. That, that I think, is what how we have to think. Because otherwise, we're constantly under this... It's like the O'Henry's, you know, the, the, the blade coming down. <laughs> uh, it's there all the time. And I think to visualize that, and it really became a reality to me. That happened historically. The Holy See was reduced. They still have quite a bit of power, unfortunately. And they have a lot of pomp, you know, with the, the, the people, all the pomp. And so it let them have that, you know. Uh, okay. <laughs> But not really the continent. So I think that, that that's a way of thinking that I think is big and then all of these issues we deal with, the factions. I grew up in Oklahoma too, and I was Southern that raised a Southern Baptist. So what happens you where you are not allowed to wear jewelry, you're not allowed to dance, you're not allowed to um, uh, to learn anything. Uh, so it's it's how I think if there's an exciting vision for the future, the Baptist doctrine will be uh, not as attractive. You know, people will be attractive. Right, right.
impactful and uh, as agitated as I can be. Uh, some of you know me, some of you don't, and I will preface what I have to say with you might not agree with me, but uh, hopefully afterwards we can have a meaningful and healthy conversation. Um, uh, yeah, hey, my name is Cleve and Ollie, was introduced a little earlier, and I met some of you during a uh, presentation earlier on uh, anti-capitalist interventions and protecting sacred places. And so I'm deeply honored to be here on uh, this wonderful panel, but I do have to admit that I'm an imposter. Um, I don't have the same credentials uh, in uh, academia, but I'm also not one I've been raised uh, to be wary of the academic industrial complex. So it's a, it's a blessing, but it's also one of the uneasy things to be here. Um, I will say that uh, I know John Redhouse through his work as a spiritual warrior. Um, I think we, we have a few things in common, even though we haven't really worked directly together. And we've worked with some of my family members from Black Mesa area uh, addressing the so-called navigable land dispute, the land conflict, um, which is an extension of the resource wars that we continue to face. And what we have in common is riot insurance. I was fascinated to, um, to read about that and your conviction in standing against the Calvary and the Farmington Parade. I thought that that was something that was really an inspiring statement of direct action. And um, I, I have writing charges in my history. They were dropped, so I'm not going to bring it up. But, um, Mount Grand Telescope shouldn't be there. And we tried to let them know by occupying the laboratory in uh, 2001. And um, they called us a riot. We were, we were in uprising. Um, you probably felt the same way, I'm sure. And so, um, I'm not shy. I, there was a question, uh, Jennifer Dendell, I'm extremely grateful for the invitation by Jennifer and uh, to also be welcomed by Marley Shapala, who are great forces out there um, working to better our communities. And uh, it was an interesting question about, uh, you know, agitation, violence, and, you know, sort of radicalism. And I'm not shy to be called a ra radical or agitator, um, but we have to look at those terms and those, you know, see if they really apply when we look at what they mean, you know, what's radical uh, is what corporations are doing to our communities, and what is, you know, terrifying, uh, the, the, the true eco-terrorists are PY the coal company, or HRI, or, um, you know, the, the Roca, uh, Honda resources, and, and so forth, Snowball, um, and, we have to look at those terms as well. When we say we're radical, let's look at what is actually radical in our communities and what we're doing to defend our communities to ensure that we have healthy communities. I think it's, you know, it's self-defense when, when it comes down to it. We want to talk about violence. We have to also talk about structural violence and what that means. Um, so uh, it was interesting in preparation to come here. I was talking to some of my relatives from Black Mesa. And I need to clarify rumors. I'm not sure. I, in all of the, the discussions and the bios and all of that, I, I wasn't sure if you were an attorney or not. Okay, because there's a lot of people on Black Mesa who think you're an attorney. <laughs> 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 I, I, I was talking about the history, and they were like, oh, yeah, John Redhouse, he's an attorney. Every time there was a problem, they said, let's go talk to John Redhouse. <laughs> 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 So tonight I would like to address that question by talking um, about continuity of struggle and uh, honoring Mr. Red House and the other elders that we have here in the movement through action. And I think that's one of the most meaningful ways that we can honor, um, you know, so looking at the continuity of the struggle that we face today. Um, you know, it's one thing to talk about these things, but we have to share in a meaningful manner to carry on the struggle so we can continue to take action to better the world so the struggle in the future is less of a challenge for the coming generations. Um, and there are many people here among us uh, tonight that I'd like to acknowledge who are a little bit more intimately connected and work direct, more directly with Mr. Redhouse as well, um, Robin Jackson, Chris Joggs, um, uh, some great uh, volunteer uh, younger generation folks who are coming up and um, of course Norman Brown and I talked a little earlier and uh, Leonard uh, Gilmore I don't know if he's still here um, 
and also uh, Leona Morgan. And there's there's quite a few other folks, and I don't want to leave anybody out, so I'll stop there. Um, I am going to read this. Hopefully, I'll be able to finish it by the end of my time. So just let me know. Um, there's because there's a few things I want to make sure. Some points I want to hit. That I make sure that I hit. Um, so John Redhouse stands as one who has a conviction to ensure that we do not forget that we are people with cultures of resistance and liberation. Through Mr. Redhouse's work to unmap, to deconstruct colonialism, we can understand and locate ourselves in the ongoing struggle for liberation of indigenous peoples and Mother Earth, and we've heard a lot about that this evening and today. It's up to us to determine how we affirm and assert and carry this struggle forward. That's why we must listen to folks. The many folks in this room are elders who have that deep experience, the wisdom. We must also listen to our hearts and carry the struggle forward. Can you imagine another system beyond capitalism? We need you to bring that vision forward. And that means we also need you to fight back. It's okay to fight back. And I think that there's a serious issue that we face in society today, in dominant society. I mean, it's part of the nature of structural violence is that we're taught not to fight back. We're criminalized when we fight back. We're taught that our identity is criminal, that we shouldn't be who we are. Our identity is desecrated to the point where we lose our agency. We don't even recognize ourselves anymore enough to have that dignity to fight back, and we need to restore that within ourselves. And that's why it's important to maintain the connection to our elders here who have that, who have worked hard, who cherish that, who maintain that, because we need to carry that forward. In fact, in the face of our oppression, it's necessary to fight back in order to have healthy communities, to ensure cultural survival and vitality. We are all too familiar with the issues that we face in our communities, and I'm going to list them because I think it's important to name them, to some of them, and I'll probably leave some out, but heteropatriarchy, environmental destruction, racism, white supremacy, capitalism, the prison industry, sexual violence, and don't let anyone tell you that sexual violence is just an individual issue. It's not, it's a community issue, and we need to recognize that and address it as such, because we, as indigenous people, having the statistics as they exist today, one in four, uh, one in three indigenous women will face sexual violence. That's unacceptable, and that's our responsibility as communities to address. <laughs> so Mount Taylor, Mount Graham, Woodruff View, South Mountain, Red View, the Grand Canyon Confluence, Black Mesa, Mount Tanabo, Medicine Lake, Ponte, Segorite, Bear View, the Coastly, the San Francisco Peaks, the Defend of Lands held holy by indigenous peoples is the physio-spiritual front line in the struggle for our cultural survival. The sacred is the perimeter of what we protect as activists today. We are faced with the desecration of social and environmental justice on our lands, history, and ways of life every day. And deep ecology, and some of you know about deep ecology, can exist without deep history. And so the presence of anti-colonial understanding or settler consciousness must be at the intersection of analysis and action in all struggles on stolen lands. Otherwise, your liberation is still colonization. We need to come to terms with that. That's part of the future of decolonization, the future of liberation. Um, it's not in my interest or intention to shift power from the state to a nonprofit corporation of paid experts. We must seek total liberation through building power in our communities on our own terms. The trajectory of unsustainable madness, we see our only option being total liberation of Mother Earth uh, human and non-human beings from capitalism. Our tactics will become more desperate with the less clean air we have to breathe, the less clean water we have to drink, and the less clean soil we have to plant our crops in. Indigenous peoples must inform strategies for liberation, or it still means colonization. As the 400-year tree falls to the logger's hands, to the lumber mill, to the shelves, while all, all the while while pockets are lined, we witness capitalism is the enemy of Mother Earth. And we understand capitalism will never be sustainable. As corporate Earth Day approaches, we have to think about this. No matter how green our jobs or how green the economy becomes, we can never sustain unsustainable lifestyles. I don't think green prisons or a green military industrial complex is the answer. That's green capitalism, and it has to be abolished too. <laughs> 
from polluted ocean to ocean, we mil and from militarized border to border, from criminalized community to community, from sexually assaulted and incarcerated body to body, violations of human freedom don't happen by accident, and oppression doesn't happen by accident. It's been stated before. The structural violence of grief and the racist neo-colonial neoliberal state manifests itself right here, right where we are. And thankfully, unoccupied New Mexico, unoccupied Albuquerque recognizes that and is taking meaningful action to address that because it's not the same throughout the rest of the country. Um, so yeah, heads up to or props out to uh, unoccupied New Mexico, right? Or to Albuquerque, unoccupied Albuquerque. Well, the next step is unoccupied. <laughs> so the question is, what are we going to do about it? We must collectively face and confront the hard reality of oppression and environmental destruction. We must cultivate our emotional and spiritual capacity to wage a resistance struggle for liberation. If we don't, who will? We must fight back. And there are local targets for you to fight back and attack. Uh, um, particularly, the regional forester has an office here for the southwest region of the U.S. Uh, or the, the U.S. Forest Service. They're the ones who have given the rubber stamp to allow the desecration of the San Francisco Peaks, which I've been arrested over five or so times in resistance to stopping the desecration at that holy site. Um, and they still have the power to stop that development. We as indigenous people don't have guaranteed protection for our religious freedom when it comes down to sacred places and public land management agencies and how they address them. And uh, it's a critical situation that we're in. I mean, not arguing that we need those rights from the state, but we need to assert ourselves in a way that we can guarantee cultural continuity and vitality. That might mean new legislation, it might mean uh, amendment to current legislation, but it also means that we need to assert ourselves in a way because you know we were being arrested, we were doing blockades and they weren't sustainable. We have very few options when it comes down to protecting sacred places. And one of the offices of the decision makers, a point for intervention here, right in, here in Albuquerque, is at the Regional Forester, and not just for the Peaks issue, but Mount Taylor. Uh, as Roca on the mine, uh, I know Leona Morgan was mentioning earlier, right now they have a comment period that ends on May 14th. Uh, submit your comments, but at the same time, it's important to cast as I guess to paraphrase Henry David Thoreau, cast your whole vote, I guess, cast your whole comment, and take it a step further. It might mean direct action, it might mean uh, different forms of action to ensure that these uh, government agencies, government forces are being held accountable. And so sometimes that means uh, organizing collectively for our liberation as a political force that can ensure that we can uh, have victory um, in, in, the, in the, these cases. Because if they open up uh, the uranium mine, Strathmore Industries, which their office is located, so the regional forester is going to make the decision on that issue is right here in Albuquerque. And Strathmore, um, the uranium mining company, has offices in Santa Fe as well. And so they're a target right there, um, about 40 miles or so, um, that folks sh should go there and hold them accountable. Um, not Don't wait until the decision from the, the, re the regional forester to give their rubber stamp to this, because right now they're trying to work on an amendment to break their own laws. Essentially, they're writing a way around their current laws that say they shouldn't uh, desecrate Mount Taylor in their environmental impact statement. It's online, read it, uh, check it out on indigenousaction.org or MACE uh, Coalition's website as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so there are many local targets. Those are just a couple in relation to some of the work that um, folks are, are focused on now. Um, but in response to racist attacks against uh, Danette due to Mount Taylor uh, traditional cultural property nomination in 2009, uh, Mr. Redhouse stated eloquently, we need a, another Pueblo revolt, a Navajo revolt, a general uprising among our people and nations. And so I'm, I'm with you, John. So hopefully the rest of the Thank you uh, to our panelists for that great insight. So now we're going to turn to you a few minutes of uh, Q and A. So, if anybody has a question, just raise your hand. Anyone for any of our panelists? Uh, here. I have a, a quick announcement, and also a question. Um, New Mexico is facing so many issues as a nuclear sacrifice zone, and another one that's coming up is a potential transfer of radioactive waste from the Hanford facility in Washington to WIP down by Carlsbad. So this Tuesday, April 23rd at 6 p.m., there is a WIP panel discussion and dinner at the Albuquerque Center for Peace and Justice at 202 Harvard Southeast. 
uh, to me to help stop high-level nuclear waste from Hanford, Washington, coming to WIP, and Tom Carpenter, a leading advocate for Hanford cleanup, uh, is the featured speaker. Um, my question is, as a non-native solidarity activist, to the extent that I'm able to be in solidarity, I was really amazed and inspired by the I Don't Know More movement that emerged in Canada and spread around the world, including to New Mexico and other places in, in occupied U.S. Um, I know Kay Matthews covered that on La Jicarita, but I was interested in getting your, the panelists' perspective on I Don't Know More and the potential for that movement to continue to grow, hopefully evolve as a potential libertarian force. Anyone? Don't just show up to the next action with your cell phone out 
Does that mean you're a spectator? Does that mean you're involved? You know, and so get involved, you know, on a, on a deep and meaningful basis. Thank you for the oh, one more thing. Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, I had a particular interest in it in terms of the ICT aspects of information communications technology, G's, and this idea of what's called social movement regionalism. So it's this idea that the larger frames that you use when you frame your issues as you're doing your activism and community organizing, the larger your frames, the more people that you can pull on board and the broader your base. So it's this idea of everybody wants, say, better jobs and to raise a per capita income in an area. Nobody's going to be against that. Everybody maybe wants a better educational system. I mean, so it's this idea of framing things broadly. And I really like the idea of I don't know more and the way that people, it's like everybody can understand land rights. In some kind of way, indigenous people, our relationship to the land, um, our dispossession of land, I see that as a frame that was like, it was like amazing just the way that, it, the way in which it, it exploded. And I've been, like I said, in LA for the past seven years, and I've been fascinated with their community organizing. And I remember right before I Don't Know More exploded, I was, it's called Las Capitetas, and they um, are like a son Paracho band. So they're doing folk music from Veracruz, and they're teaching youth, and they're uh, raising their political consciousness. So they're educating them. They're activating them, they're mobilizing them, mobilizing them to go and advocate. So that's the aspect of this I Don't Know More movement that I really um, appreciated. That people, you know, they came out in flash mobs, but it was around culture, identity, and land. And the, things, the way it exploded in, like, say, a month, I saw community organizers that had worked for years for that in LA. So again, like, it's kind of like the same thing with Occupy. The Occupy movement fell apart because it didn't have like the scaffolding, scaffolding to move forward. So I think that that's the other piece, you know, that you alluded to. With you know, you need a strategy to make it happen on the ground and sustain it. Thank you for those responses. Another question? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Leonard Sosi, and I'm hoping that as a former student. Will qualify you to ask the questions. <laughs> but I'm, uh, as a disclaimer, I'm also a council delegate of Navajo Council, and it's with interest in listening to you guys. Um, the question I have is the misinformation that is spread within the environmental circle, and does that lead to disharmony? I'm going to give you some examples. When Mr. Brown was talking, he said that the council wants to remove the Attorney General. But the information behind that, the true information, is that the council gave him a direction to send, a, as, as our Attorney General, and he's a Western Navajo educated individual that's working for us. And we asked him to send a letter to Senator Kyle to decouple the NGS and the water rights negotiation, and he didn't do it. As a lawyer, you fulfill your client's instructions. And so when you no longer behave like that, you have to be removed. And I can talk about other things, but that was one of the main reasons for me. So I signed on, I signed on to the legislation. See, that's a misinformation. And what it causes is it causes people to be all revved, revved up, you know, against the council. That they're, they're just, they just want power. You know? And the other one is, and I'm, I'm sorry that Ms. Korsberger had to leave. The misinformation is her not telling you that the council listened to her. And uh, some of us, like myself and Catherine Benali, insisted upon her presentation at the council. Let her speak. Let her speak. And she gave a message. 
And the other thing too is, and Mr. Forrest Porter will tell you this, and I'm glad to say that at my behest, I said we need to have and we need to have grassroots people be involved with the water rights negotiations. And as a member within the government circle in Window Rock, I insisted upon that. And she, it took a while, but she, they finally came in. And so, but the problem we ran into is all this Facebooking and social networking. See, and there are some things that not all government has to hold dear to its heart that's confidential and privileged in these litigations. But then when we went to Window Rock, all this information was on the web. And it's scary. And so we said, where did this information come from? So by the time we got to Phoenix, all of the state parties were ready for us because they already knew what we were going to say. See, and so that's the problem and the risk we take when we do this. And the other thing too is, I, you know, I end up being a bad guy with the environment, with the government, because I was against the ADA. And then, you know, and sometimes my neighbors, I don't know, I was thinking of seeking refuge in this letter, but I don't think that will hold it all except me. <laughs> you know, where, where, the other day I was meeting with USDA about all this dust problem on the Navajo Nation. And we're talking about uh, discontinuing mini grazing leases. And also the way we grade roads. And the dust problem caused by homestead leases. But I've never seen, I've never seen a single Enviro raising that issue. It's a big problem on the Navajo Nation. So little old me, you know, try to talk about that at the Resource Development Committee, and I get hammered from both sides. And one of the things is that let's put revegetation requirement in these home site leases. Let's cause the homeowners to put gravel on their road or the way the road is graded. See, and so those things happen out there, and I believe, you know, and I, I list these as misinformation, or just not wanting to talk about it. And, and, it's a, and I think when we say fight, 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 we are actually working against the Navajo concept and native concept of harmony. You know, you know, when we just say fight, fight, fight. And so, but I want to thank John Redhouse. You know, I, I read his Geopolitics of Navajo Land Dispute. And it was an eye opener for me. I never marched with him. And so, but I did my own little marching. You know, with a lady by the name of Mamie Edway. When John, or uh, Secretary Watts, wanted to open up coal mining all over. Mamie Edway, is a Navajo lady from Naizi, New Mexico. And I picked her up at four in the morning. And then she told me to feed all her goats and her goat kids and everything first before we get on Navajo Transit bus to Santa Fe. Her testimony single-handedly turned the whole thing around at that committee meeting. And she was all over the paper the next morning. A Navajo lady that never went to college and you know, and she 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 got into a face off with Governor at that time, Congressman Richardson. And so you know, and, and, and that's what I did. But I have found out that this campaigning against coal mining does not bring jobs and some prosperity for Navajo Nation, for Navajo people. We need to find a balance. What is the balance? And I've always asked the environs for that. I need some ideas. Nicole, help me. You know, Tuli Hazwood, help me. Mr. Bluehouse, help me. But one of the things I found too is that the Enviros then end up going on Facebook and putting horns on me as one of the bad guys. You know, and, and that's the misinformation. And it just promotes this harmony between tribal government and its people and also the outside. Granted, I agree, there is misinformation in the corporate circle too and in the government circle. But that doesn't mean that we need to subscribe to that. What we should be seeking is harmony, you know, and, 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 and trying to figure out a way to improve the lives that we, we need revenue. 
If Navajo Nation had no revenue, they cannot fight these court battles. And so, you know, there's got to be some balance. So that's what I'm addressing is the, 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 the misinformation in the environmental circle causing disharmony, you know, in these movements. And also by the people, and we end up using the people as our pawns, the government, the environment, and the corporate. Thank you. Which one of the panels, or Dr. Nectar, you would like to respond? I want to thank you all once again for coming. Um, I really appreciate the presence um, to honor um, John Red's house. Like I said, his work was just really um, a source of inspiration for me. Um, I not really. I want to also thank um, Council Delegate uh, Leonard Sosa for coming. He was here during the interview, and he came to this one, so I really appreciate that. I think one of the things that I heard John talk about, which I think was really important, was to listen to the people and to listen to the community organizers. And I also think that it's not entirely correct, um, coming off of Mr. Uh, Council Delegate Sosi's um, statement, it's not entirely correct that all the violence, all the uh, agitation, all of the radicalism, all the anger comes from the community organizers. Okay? And that's been larger ways of disenfranchising and undermining people's true motivation. Okay? Um, I think that we have, and I appreciate the work that all of you do, and please thank you so much for what you do.
Well, turn it around and say, well, would you advocate for us? Sign here. Give us your name so we can contact you. Is this a good question or a request that I ask of all of you? <laughs> Which panel member would like to respond? Well, they have supper class. That's our supper. They were the meanest and most vicious of it. Our body tradition. Um, I do think that, you know, that we have to get to um, the separate population. And the immigrant population, the immigrants come in, they know nothing of the U.S. history, they only know the mythology. They have to pass an exam to be a citizen that forces them to memorize even this mythology. And, and so they work upon that uh, assumption. And they've done a better job in Canada, like I was mentioned, uh, no one is legal, uh, an organization in, in uh, British Columbia. Is, is really a model of how we should work with the, you know, immigrants here. I think, you know, Mets, I'm not talking about migrants, you know, and economists, because they know the United States pretty well, but I'm talking about immigrants from the rest of the world. But how should they know? How could they know? Um, so I think we have to also get to the youth of the suburb population, the descendants of the suburbs, because what I find, and uh, in, in my case, and, you know, growing up in rural Oklahoma, and when people, um, and I work with a lot of, of young people there now, when they learn what their ancestors did, it, the truth of it, they don't feel guilty, they feel angry that their ancestors were put in that position, because they were very poor people too. They feel angry that they were used by colonialism and capitalism, and it, it, it does energize them. It actually is liberating. The truth is really liberating. And we have to really believe that, not just try to manipulate them or only deal with the rich liberals because they, you know, they current what we have to say and they give some money. But they're not the people that we should be appealing to. We need to reach the, the poor masses of people, black and white. It is also most African Americans don't really completely understand, you know, the, they haven't understood, they understand racism very well and they understand the commonality, but we don't understand the land and the relationship. We need to, we need to be generous and really, really share, uh, share that knowledge. All right, we have time for one more. Oh, that was the time. You want to meet me now? Okay. <laughs>
University of Yellow. And her really powerful traditional grassroots peoples were talking about the resistance of fight against uh, uranium. And I know, uh, like myself, and uh, Thomas Sin, with, with, when I saw this poster again, reminded me about uh, uh, protecting sacred lands. And yet, uh, like, like uh, Leonard was, was talking about, but we need the money. We need the money in order to survive today. And when I saw what happened in Paris with the auction of the, of the Katrina masks, you know, I, 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 I said to Simon, well, this is capitalism. That's what capitalism is. Everything can be bought and sold on, in the marketplace. And and then and then we talked a lot about uh, you know I'm, we're planning for the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, and then we came up with some themes that needs to be discussed in Alton, Norway, and then of course at the WCIP meetings in New York next September. Uh, some of these themes I I couldn't believe it that Indigenous Peoples were against the theme of decolonization, uh, the theme of sovereignty, the theme of uh, 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 self determination. Uh, epicide, ethnocide, all those things that uh, you would think that indigenous peoples would opt that needs to be discussed on a global scale by indigenous peoples. But some people think that we have to participate now in democracy, that we have to participate in capitalism, that we have to make money, that's what makes the world spin. So I think uh, we ourselves, you know, when we become part of the problem because of being brainwashed, because we don't remember or look at our own history, then we get caught up in playing the game. And I and Jared Te Teikai, uh, uh, you know, professor author, have this, you know, well, why should we play the white man's game if this adds to the demise of the indigenous peoples? So we do need your help as, as young peoples, as activists, uh, uh, as mentioned by probably Leona and John mentioned that too, uh, the draft department impact statement, I just came from meetings this morning with uh, my tribal officials. Uh, we're happy to come at, at, uh, at this intellectual uh, game, you know, using, using consultants that we pay lots of money to, using attorneys, uh, but we really need the help of the grassroots peoples. We need the help of the tribes. Uh, unfortunately, the tribes, you know, tend to, you know, just uh, look at the BIA or look at the federal government, in this case, the U.S. Forest Service. But we need the, the grassroots people's life. I was really very, very encouraged by the Navajo people themselves, who are really uh, just saying, no, no more terrain mining.
we're at the end of our program. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to especially thank our special guests, John Ray the House and Carol, uh, for coming and gracing us with your presence. And, and you know, it's been a really wonderful day. Thank you for coming far and wide. Um, and we have collected uh, some money here for Cleese Indigenous Network and in the One. Thank you for doing this. And we're going to end with a um, song by Clee. Thank you. Um, maybe some more people know the song too. So, if uh, Mr. Redhouse, if you'd like to come down here, and anybody else, we're going to sing uh, maybe two songs, uh, honoring songs. So, if you want to uh, shake his hand, um, we're going to sing the Peltier song. So, if you know it, come on down, and then maybe we'll close with the Aim song. So, there's enough rowdy people here to know. So, just don't be shy. Come, come join us. Come down and make yourself, you know.
it's good to be here with everybody, and that's what this is for, so, yeah.